Welcome, everyone, to episode seven of The Dominator. I'm your host, as always, Josh Larkey. Joined special guest, player profilers, director of content. You all know him. Theo Greminger at the OG Fantasy on the X slash Twitter machine. Today, we are going to be talking underdog fantasy ADPs. We're going to be talking a lot of rookies. And you are probably exhausted with Dynasty Rookie Talk at this point. However, not too many podcasts are covering redraft or best ball strategy for these rookies. That is primarily what we are going to talk today. Theo, the draft's in a couple of weeks. How are you feeling about everything? I'm I'm so excited. We're going to be together uh, down in Detroit, and Josh is going to be joining us for our stream. We're going to be streaming every single round. It is hands down the best fantasy football coverage you will find for the NFL draft. The Podfather, Josh, uh, Cody Carpentier, Matty Kiwum, mm-hmm. Alex Dunlap. I mean, we have such a, a a large group of analysts that are going to be covering this. Plus, we have Jason Allwine, Bradley Stalder. Seth Dewald mm-hmm. and Anand Nanduri at the NFL draft itself. It feels it, it feels so like it feels a little bit far away, but it's really like right around the corner. 13 days out. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm so excited about it. And and we like you said, like I've been hitting the dynasty dynasty content really, really hard. I'm really ready to know landing spots, Josh, because we've dove into these guys extensively. And then we have that little mini one week window between the actual NFL draft and our dynasty rookie drafts where it like sort of like we have to like reevaluate everything. So I I, I want to know uh, two weeks from today, we'll know where Marvin Harrison Jr. is playing and where Malik Neighbors is playing and where, you know, Drake, D- Drake May is playing. It's going to be, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. I'm very excited. You and I have known each other now for probably around half a decade. We have not hung out in person. That will change in two weeks at the draft. Everyone remembers that that podcast I did back in the day, code breaker when I had on and on durian and now he and I are going to meet. We have never met either. It's it's going to be a very, very good time. Cody and I have not met before. We, we've obviously video chat many times, never met in person. It's going to be a very, very good time. And one thing that is in even better time than socializing and fraternizing at the draft is talking about team level analysis, folks. That's how you do a transition. What I like about team level analysis, it's often easier than individual player takes. It can, it can generally be a little bit easier to say, I think this offense is good, this offense is bad. That, that is something that often leads us in the right direction for fantasy football. Theo, with that being said, give me an offense that you've been stacking a lot on underdog right now based on these ADPs. You know, I, I've I've sort of been a little bit more uh, diverse in, in my stacking. I've tried to put together some Bears stacks, um, which I think could end up like Caleb Williams stacks. I think those have, have been pretty good. Um, I've been pretty open with this though i think the dallas cowboys stacks have been pretty cheap where i can put a you know a cd lamb with a dak prescott and then a jake ferguson really pretty easily uh right now when i'm using that early one on lamb so i'd say i'm I'm not being like quite as like dogmatic with it I, i'd say that i'm a little bit more kind of open um and i do think that there's value to be had with you know several of these offenses right now in terms of your builds uh, you know, looking at, and I'll say this in terms of like the really high end ones, I got a good amount of Philly stacks and it's not necessarily that I wanted to go in doing it, but you're, you're able to do a Philly stack so much easier uh, than you were last year. You're actually able to put together like an AJ Brown, Devonta Smith, Jalen Hurts build. Um, whereas last year that would have cost you an arm and a leg. So I'd say that I'm not like, uh, I'm not quite as like, I need to make this particular stack. I'm sort of spreading it around on several stacks right now when it comes to my top rostered stacks. You're spreading it around, but there's probably at least one team out there. You're you're mostly avoiding at this point. Which offense is simply too expensive in this this part of the pre-draft process? Well, for a while, it was the Houston Texans because Nico Collins had steamed up to wide receiver nine, um, and I really couldn't get behind that price. Uh, now, will I be able to kind of dive into it a little bit more now that it's a little bit more like a lack of clarity between the three main targets? Maybe. I think that I'm going to be taking a couple more shots. It's funny, like with the two contests, the the big board and then the biggest board, I, I maxed out the biggest board, which is the $100 entry one. So I have three entries there. 
And in one of those, I actually do have a Houston stack. I think it's a CJ Stroud, Tank Dell, Dalton Schultz stack. But when it came to like the big board, the $10 contest where, you know, you obviously have more entries for whatever reason, I just wasn't doing it because of the price. So I'd say Houston's the one that I'm kind of underweight on um, of the teams that I think could absolutely burn me. Yeah, that's that's one that I, I think is going to be pretty key for people to get right, just with how expensive they all are, but also the fact that we're sort of in this uncharted territory where Stroud's rookie season was better than pretty much any rookie quarterback season we had seen. Let me, I want to get your take on the, this one. This is completely, we're going off the show sheet. This is just a question that I got asked, or, or I guess someone in the comments kind of told me uh, a couple of days ago. They said, I overstacked the Green Bay Packers. I love the Green Bay Packers. I'm stacking a lot of Packers. They said I overstacked the Packers because I had Jordan Love and five pass catchers. And my my rebuttal to that, because they they what they basically said is, Josh, it is truly impossible for all five of them to hit their ADP and to pay off. I completely agree. When I draft five guys, they are not all going to hit. They like if I if I'm drafting them at like wide receiver 20, wide receiver 30, wide receiver 40, whatever, so on and so forth. Yes, they are not all going to hit that per game. However, in best ball, you're really trying to fill out those three to four slots for receiver. I don't need all of them to crush their ADP. What I need is one or two to crush their ADP. And on the rare week that those guys don't hit, I have that nice negative correlation where it's like, why did Jaden Reed struggle this week? Dontavian Wicks had 100 yards and a touchdown. That's kind of how I view it is that I don't actually need Dontavian Wicks to beat his ADP if I'm taking him on a team that has Reed and Watson. I'm just saying, hey, any week that Reed or Watson struggles, either the whole offense sucks and then I'm just uh, SOL, or Dontavian Wicks has now stepped up. Is that kind of your take, or am I just absolutely insane if I'm ever drafting Love with five Packers? Well, you're sort of drafting the contingent upside when you sort of like, you're essentially kind of, not necessarily cuffing, but you're you're having like a, a buffer for, you know, the particular wide receiver struggling, you're basically making a bet that Jordan Love is going to return value at ADP. I would agree on that one. And also we're seeing the pass catchers for Green Bay. It's just so jumbled. There's such a lack of clarity with how the, the targets are going to be dispersed. Like Jaden Reed is wide receiver 34 today, and he's the most expensive one. Um, Christian Watson last year steamed up. Now he's sort of an afterthought. He's wide receiver 44. And I, I love that you said Dontavian Wicks because I think Dontavian Wicks has like been a target of mine as well. Where even if I'm not stacking Packers, um, we saw him post spike weeks and we saw him flash as a rookie. He could be like the one there. And I'll say like I also have liked the double tap of of Musgrave and Kraft um, mm -hmm. because I think it gives you like a like I think that's a sneaky way to kind of attack tight end too because. Musgrave is cheap relative to his upside and Kraft is also cheap relative to like what we saw in the field last year. Um, they both sort of are, are, are deflating the value of both of them. So I don't know. And, and when you get to it, uh, Josh, you know, you'd be better than I would on this, but you wrote one of the best articles I've ever read when it comes to stacking. And it's sort of an evergreen piece that you did for player profiler. Gosh, this must've been three years ago. By three years Maybe, ago. Yeah. Yeah. So about three years ago, Josh did an, uh, a guide to stacking. Um, it had to have been like 10 pages. It was really long, but it was really, really um, filled with like data points. You backed it up with analysis and you basically made an argument for stacking. Um, that was kind of like, we, we have so much knowledge on the 18 uh, man roster underdog, but now you have these this 20 man roster underdog that's sort of become the norm and also on FFPC. So I think you have a little more wiggle room to do your mega stacks with 20 mm -hmm. roster spots than you do 18. So I, I don't have a problem with it. If you want to dive in, dive in. And you're also diving in uh, in a situation that's costing you wide receiver 34 at the top. And on stacks, you skip Jaden Reed. You're talking about you're into like the wide receiver four land anyway. So I, I don't have a problem with it. Good, good. I have so many Packer stacks in the portfolio. Now that whether or not it's a good strategy to stack Packers, we can debate that one thing we cannot debate. It is certifiably year after year, a good strategy to draft rookies and best ball 
ahead of the NFL draft. That's the exact type of player that can move up significantly in ADP post-draft. Based on the landing spot, the draft capital, some combo of those, we see that every single year. I'm, I'm sure everyone listening right now can start to think, and they're like, oh yeah, I I remember when Rasheed Rice went to the Chiefs and his ADP went up for a reason. It's because he went to the Chiefs with pretty early draft capital. This stuff matters. These are the types of players that can jump up four, five, six, seven rounds in best ball drafts. We're going to talk about a lot about rookies we are drafting. But first, we're each going to give a rookie we're not drafting much of on Underdog Fantasy because, unfortunately, there are occasionally guys that a uh, little steep pre-draft. Who, who is that rookie receiver for you? And I, I think we'll be butting heads on this one, but it's Jonathan mm-hmm. Brooks. And Jonathan Brooks is a guy that mm-hmm. I'm certainly going to have a lot of on in on Dynasty rosters. And I think I'd probably be more open to drafting him if we were doing an early redraft. But when it comes to best ball, uh, it's it, when it comes to best ball, I don't want to hold tickets that I think could be sort of like d- dead tickets. It's not kind of the, the right word for it. But Jonathan Brooks, we don't cer- certainly don't know his kind of timetable to return. So we have the variable that we don't know the landing spot. He could land in a spot that's not good for his year one, like production. He took a top 30 visit to Tampa Bay. Joining a backfield with Rashad White would certainly cap him. Then I have the variable that I don't know what week he's going to be uh, able to participate in training camp. Now, a lot of people are saying he'll be ready for August, but we see those timetables change. Then we kind of look at the ADP price, and Jonathan Brooks is running back 36. I don't know if he's necessarily a stronger bet than a few of those other running backs like a Jalen Wright who's a running back 42 um Trey Benson who's wide running back 31 is just a little bit more expensive so for me it's just been sort of avoiding Jonathan Brooks at this price uh it could burn me in early best balls uh but that's sort of how I'm seeing it wow we just have to get right into it so I'll, I'll give the the bull case for Jonathan Brooks and we'll let the the listeners kind of decide where they want to go on it. They're probably going to end up falling in the middle of us, would be my guess. So Brooks is actually not someone I think I'm going to have much of in Dynasty, simply because a lot of people love him. And he's their rookie RB1 or RB2, potentially in, in this like very high tier, separate from several other players I think are very similar. And in Dynasty, that's very costly to me. Uh, that That's a kind of pick that can burn you, not just for one year, but multiple years. He tore his ACL last year, and he also had one season of college production last year. That's actually very concerning to me in terms of him as a dynasty asset if he couldn't hold up to the one year he actually had a workload. The rushing stats are pretty good. They weren't special. His pass catching was really efficient, though the volume wasn't very heavily. Yet, I'm starting to see reports he could play week one. I don't know if he does or not, but at least that's on the table. He's going to get round two or round three draft capital, which we like. I figure there's chances that he lands somewhere like Dallas. People comp him to Tony Pollard. The Cowboys have shown interest. The betting markets think there's a good chance that he ends up going there. And I think there's a, there's places like that where his ADP shoots up. So I actually am willing to take some shots in best ball thinking, even if he's not ready week one, this is one of the few guys in the class that has a potential all purpose skill set. And when you're taking him at, at the back end of RB three for fantasy, I don't know if I need him the first month of the season. What I'm kind of hoping for is that he becomes the starter based on merit towards the end of the year when he's fully healthy and gives me spike weeks end of season. So I'm actually kind of out in dynasty based on his cost, but I'm like, Hey, in redraft, it doesn't really hurt me nearly as much because I know he's going to play at least somewhat. I don't think he's giving you zeros this year. Yeah. I mean, talent wise, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I think that he's a, he's very, very talented and he certainly can catch passes as well. It's sort of just a little bit more of a, and that we could go really deep in the weeds here. A lot of my early builds are waiting on running back um, where I call, I call it, you know, the, the, the haters won't like this, but it's sort of a modified hero approach where I can Uh wait on running back, take my first running back in like the fourth round. And then I need those guys when we get to like the low end RB three land to kind of give me, something I can lean on weekly. So as ugly as it seems, I look at the two guys that are sort of bracketing Jonathan Brooks, Devin Singletary at RB35, 
Chase Brown at RB37. I could see both of those guys being very useful, and I don't have that sort of injury risk, mm-hmm. lack of clarity on how many games. It's sort of a, it's also, a, I guess, a build argument as well to sort of avoid the injured running back in that range. I think that's a good point. Now, uh, this one might also be controversial. Theo and I, I promise, folks, we're, we're going to agree starting soon in the show, most likely. But I, I haven't drafted much Marvin Harrison. I wanted to lay that out and kind of get your take since I, I think you're the most bullish person that I know on Marvin me, Harrison. It hurts me. So his ADP right now is pick 16, wide receiver nine. The way I see it is Malik Neighbors is the same caliber of prospect, give or take. Most metrics put them pretty similar. Some draft analysts out there prefer Neighbors, slightly more prefer Harrison. Yet Neighbors ADP is 27. Much uh, You basically get to wait a, a, another round for a similar type of player. I think Neighbors is the one that could end up with Herbert, where Harrison Jr. gets Kyler. I'm kind of chasing whoever can get to play for the Chargers. Right now, it's slightly chalkier that Harrison is the one on Arizona. Neighbors is the one with the Chargers. And we had 2020, Justin Jefferson, wide receiver, nine points per game. 2021, Jamar Chase was wide receiver, five points per game. No elite rookies in 2022. And then in 2023, Puka Nakua was the wide receiver, six per game. All three of those guys, though, had non-mobile quarterbacks. Jefferson had Cousins. Chase had Burrow. Puka had Stafford. There is that slight chance. Actually, more there is a good chance Harrison ends up with Kyler, slightly more mobile. I I just get a little bit concerned there. Do you have any pushback? You might have pushback on me. Just at this point, I might have one percent Marvin Harrison, and it is slightly scary. I will admit. I feel like my builds look great when I draft Marvin Harrison Jr. And I I agree with you that Malik Neighbors. He's a guy that I'm going to talk about as a guy I see as a value at wide receiver 18 right now. An immense yeah, just talent. hop into that as well. We, yeah. actually, we actually have Malik Neighbors as number uh, the number one wide receiver in this class on the breakout finder. And also, we did a cumulative ranking on our rookie guide, Josh. And Josh, you contributed to the rookie guide. Um, you did a great job in, in a player write-up. But we had five different rankers. Uh, you it was Troy Franklin was your was your wide receiver in the rookie guide. If you want to read Josh's works, highly recommend mm-hmm. our rookie guide, it's top notch. But we had five different uh, people doing rankings. It was Cody Carpentier, myself, Matty Kiwum, John Lobb, and then a collective effort from our friends at the Undroppables, uh, Jax Falcone and Chalk. Those guys did like sort of an Undroppables uh, rating. And when it came down to it, for our overall single QB rankings, Malik Neighbors actually finished as number one. Marvin Harrison Jr. as number two. So player profiler... We're very bullish on Malik Neighbors. I personally have Marvin Harrison Jr. at wide receiver mm-hmm. one, but again, five different rankers. Um, so there's, uh, you know, we're probably the only one that has Neighbors ahead of them collectively. On our dynasty rankings, we have Harrison Jr. still ahead of Neighbors. Um, but for me, Josh, it's how dare you? Marvin Harrison <laughs> Jr., greatest wide receiver we've ever, a prospect, one of the best prospects we've ever seen. And also when we talk about best ball theory, we're talking about guys who can destroy fantasy for a three-week sprint. So right now he's priced as as wide receiver nine on underdog, but I actually think that's fair because when if I asked you to name a handful of wide receivers that could absolutely crush it mm-hmm. simply in the underdog playoffs and be the one that you need, like the people ever says, this is the one that you need, Marvin Harrison Jr. could be the one that you need. He has that sort of ceiling where he's the kind of guy that could give you uh, six touchdowns in a three-week uh, sprint. Like those immense spike weeks, those three straight 25-point, uh, P- mm-hmm. half-point PPR weeks. And I think that it's okay to be bullish on neighbors, but you also want to have that exposure to a player like that. And I also think that his floor, like you bring up Arizona and you bring up the Chargers, you know, you're still getting super excited about him being the wide receiver one in Arizona. I actually think that if he lands on either of those teams, his redraft ADP is going to improve. I don't really know if he can go past wide receiver nine on underdog. There'll certainly certainly be some resistance, but there's scenarios where he could, you know, move up a a spot or two. Um, So I, I just think it's the immense talent and the fact that 
even Josh Larkey, someone who understands draft theory and being able to project what NFL teams are going to do, is saying you still think he's going to go top five to the Cardinals or the Chargers type situation. So Marvin Harrison Jr., it's really hard for me to see him failing, not returning like a top 15 season, but mm -hmm. it's really the spike week potential that makes him such a target for me in that range of the draft. I like how you framed that. The the weeks 15, 16, 17 matter most. I I have to give it to you. I I could see Marvin Harrison Jr. crushing for three straight weeks. Let's talk about Malik Neighbors more. You identified him as a, a player that you're going to draft a lot of on underdog fantasy. Just get right down to it. So he he's going a full round later than Marvin Harrison Jr. What what else should we know about what what Neighbors' potential is? Neighbors is, is an incredible player. I mean, I think that our our NFL comp on player profiler right now is Jamar Chase, but he's sort of to me like a squint and see, and I don't know, like putting this on a guy for expectations, but when you watch him play, he has some Antonio Brown to him in the way he can just take over a game, uh, his explosiveness. It's it's just he's an incredible player. This is a guy that uh LSU's produced some great ones in the NFL and mm -hmm. No one has had more catches at LSU or more receiving yardage than Malik Neighbors. He's an immense talent. Backs it up in his pro day with a 4-4-4-40. They say the pro day 40s, you can't trust them, but it looked pretty 4-4-4 to me. 38-inch vertical. He's a big-time athlete, big-time production. He's going to land very well. Um, even if he lands on the New York Giants, I could see him that being like the scenario where he actually sees the most targets. Um, so... For me, when you see a guy like that at wide receiver 18 on underdog, like I think he's going to outscore. I'll give you a bold take. I think he outscores Chris Olave without knowing his landing spot. Olave is going wide receiver 17. And we, when I said that I think Marvin Harrison Jr. has a chance to gain value after the NFL draft in terms of ADP, I know Malik Neighbors is going to gain value. Because if Malik Neighbors lands where you're saying he's going to land to the Chargers – he is going to be drafted ahead of, let's say he moves up to like wide receiver 13 on underdog really, really quickly. So right now he's wide receiver 19. Mm -hmm. He He's a lock to be a wide receiver two and has a chance to kind of touch up on wide receiver one land if he lands well. People are going to love him the more they learn about him too. Right now you see some of these people that are really learn about prospects when they're drafted or during the draft weekend. Like they know a little bit. But I think when you get the landing spot and then you see the, the highlights and the potential immediate rookie year role, Neighbors just checks off every single box to be a very, very good fantasy asset right out the gate. I would agree there. One player that I am drafting a lot of, Blake Corum. His ADP is 131 right now. He's the running back 40. I currently have him RB1 in the class. Not everyone does. That's okay. He doesn't go RB1 on underdog, so it's okay. He's actually going right next to Zach Charbonnet. Zach Charbonnet, folks, is a handcuff. There, are, You're not getting spike weeks from Zach Charbonnet unless Kenneth Walker gets hurt. I'd say Blake Corum has the best chance among running backs from this class to just show up from week one onward and get 15 carries and one to three targets per game. Chargers have been the most likely landing spot when you look at the betting markets. There's the ties to Jim Harbaugh, who coached him at Michigan and in, is now the Chargers coach. 2022 was an elite college season. PFF wrote an article about why they thought Blake Corum should have won the Heisman that year. PFF, they hate running backs. They thought Blake Corum should have won the Heisman in 2022. That is a real article they wrote and stand behind, and it makes sense. He was so unbelievable that year. Then he tears his meniscus. It's in his knee. He still has 17 carries per game the next year, but the efficiency wanes. Folks, that makes sense. People are trying to figure out, oh, is 2022 the real him, 2023? It's probably somewhere slightly in the middle. I would lean closer to 2022, though, because now he's the, the full year removed from that injury, and he's just so, so cheap right now as a guy that can legitimately show up from week one onward and give you fantasy points. Any any thoughts on Blake Corum before we take a quick break? No, I actually have plenty of Blake Corum uh, in best ball. I think he's perfectly priced. Uh, and I think that, you know, we don't have to worry about uh, NFL draft capital with him. I think he's going to be a guy that's going to be drafted on day two. And if the floor completely falls out from under him and somehow he slips out of day two, 
He'll be one of the first few picks off the board in the fourth round. I think NFL teams are going to like him a lot. Uh, he was yes. a mega producer, and that four five three forty at the combine, like uh, any like kind of Blake Corum haters were saying that he didn't have the speed. That was a win for him. His speed score was certainly close to a hundred, very comparable to Javante Williams as an athlete coming out. So I'm uh, I'm on Blake Corum. There's not a whole lot to dislike about Corum at his ADP price on Underdog right now. Yeah, he's also just a monster. Uh, yeah, I don't know too much about how good he is at pass blocking, but I'll tell you this. He certainly has the ability to do it because this guy led all running backs at the combine and bench press reps, which I do know matters for pass blocking. He had the same amount of bench press reps as number one offensive tackle in this class, Joe Alt. Yeah, I love that. uh, Joe Alt's got about 100 pounds on Blake Corm. Blake Corm's arms are a little shorter, which gives him better levers, little leverage, but... Still, 100 pounds lighter, same amount of bench press reps. This guy is a workout warrior. Coaches are going to love him. And the podfather loves underdog fantasy. This episode brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy has been sponsoring Player Profiler and everything we're doing here since 2020. Sign up. Use promo code UNDERWORLD for a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. 100% instant deposit match up to $100. And you're like, oh, well, you know, everyone's on Underdog. Not true. There's plenty of people in this audience that have not yet tried out Underdog, and it's time. They're adding more sports. They're adding more contests. Like when we're heading into NFL drafts, season there's the rookies and sophomores game when you think about way too early fantasy football that's what underdog is when you think about best ball that's what underdog is and if you can pick players at the end of an underdog fantasy best ball draft that are under rostered that few people are picking at all and that guy like Kyron williams hits you will likely experience positive returns all you need is that one guy at the end who no one else is rostering and the way to find that guy is to listen to us UnderdogFantasy.com. The promo code is Underworld. 100% deposit match up to $100 with promo code Underworld. Underdog makes everything we do possible. I remember back in, I believe it was 2021 for that season. Back when I was a player profiler, we had an exclusive partnership with Underdog. That was a big year for the brand. Underdog, still in our hearts, still a big sponsor of the show. Theo, let's keep it moving. Give me another rookie. You're drafting a lot of on underdog fantasy. The listeners need to know another running back that they should be targeting. So uh, I'll keep it with the the highest pedigree guy kind of left that we haven't talked about is Roma Dunze. Roma Dunze is wide receiver 29 on underdog. And I think this is a perfect price point. You bought, brought up the, the sort of the discount you get from going from Marvin Harrison Jr. down to Malik Neighbors. It's an even bigger discount when you go down to a Dunze. And a Dunze is somebody that I think largely in fantasy is being valued as the wide receiver three in the class. But I think there's going to be a couple of NFL teams, more than a couple, that probably have him as wide receiver two in the class. Uh, And there might be a few that have him as wide receiver one. His best comparable on our site is Justin Jefferson. This was a player that had the most fantasy points of any wide receiver in college football last year. So you're usually looking at some like, you know, non power five league has some guy that just goes nuclear. Roma Dunze was put up these amount of stats next to Jalen Polk, who is going to be drafted most likely on day two as well. And for a little bit of the season, I mean, Jalen McMillan was injured, but the target competition was there for a Dunze and he's still mm-hmm. able to, you know, produce at such a high level. This is a guy that, Josh, I think is going to be a top six pick in the NFL draft, top eight pick in the NFL draft. There's only a spot where I think that he would stay at this level would be Chicago. If he dra- is drafted by Chicago at nine overall, which could happen, then I think there's a scenario where you say, you know, the target ceiling is not there. It sort of makes sense to keep him as a mid wide receiver three based on talent and based on the quality of the offense. But a lot of other scenarios, he's skyrocketing. And you bring up the landing spots of Arizona and the Chargers. If there's a slight trade down, you could see Mm -hmm. one of these teams ending up with a Dunze. Then you're talking about a Dunze gaining, you know, he'd move up to 10 spots in the wide receiver ADP. I think it's just a perfect opportunity for NFL draft capital is going to be there. Talent, 
and potential situation. I agree there. I'm going to go with another rookie wide receiver that I'm drafting a lot of. We're we're not going to we're not going to hide it anymore. We you mentioned that I wrote up Troy Franklin for the rookie guide. I wrote him up for the rookie guide because I really really like Troy Franklin. His ADP is 124 on underdog. That's wide receiver 57. That means he's going behind AD Mitchell, ADP 90. Xavier Worthy, ADP 96. Even Lad McConkey goes two spots ahead of him at wide receiver. Troy Franklin should be going round one in the NFL draft. He's going ahead of AD Mitchell. He's going ahead of Lad McConkey in pretty much every mock draft. He and Worthy kind of trade off who's going ahead. Mocks frequently have him going to the Buffalo Bills. Maybe he ends up in the Chiefs. There are so many good landing spots for him. He had this unique combination of a pretty good average depth of target with significant yards after the catch in college. Usually the guys that have tons of yards after the catch are catching the ball two, three, five, seven yards from the line of scrimmage, and then they make guys miss. Rather than catching deep targets, it's actually kind of counter what a lot of people think. It's harder to get yak on those deeper targets. He was productive his sophomore year. He was productive his junior year. People are concerned because uh, oh, huh, he ran low four fours at the combine and he had a skinny frame. He had the flu right before the combine. He talked about how he lost about 10 pounds. He has since gained it back. He looks like he's in much better physical shape now. Uh, I'm not concerned about him. This is a guy that can win with his route running. He's fast. He was productive. I, I have very few concerns. I love all the landing spot possibilities. And if, if he doesn't hit, who cares? Wide receiver 57. But based on landing spot, he goes to the, the Bills, the Chiefs. I could see this rising into the, the wide receiver 35 to 40 range. And this is the kind of player I'm trying to target. Give me, give me another rookie that you really, really like right now, pre-draft. So I have two left. I have a running back and a tight end. You, you, you pick, Josh. Go with the running back. We, I thought you okay. were going to go with this running back last time. That's why I was like, let me hear this running back. And oh, then I, I, we just so I, went I with Odunze. So let, let's hear the running back. We'll save the tight end for later. Trey, Trey Benson for me. And Trey Benson, I, I think, will be the top running back selected uh, in the NFL draft. Incredible NFL combine. Runs a 4-3-9-40. We've seen a number of players in that 4-3-8, 4-3-9 range have immediate fantasy success. Jonathan Taylor who's about 10 pounds heavier. Um, but when it comes to comparable size in terms of speed score, guys, Brees Hall, Ken Walker, Trey Benson sort of in that wheelhouse for, for ath athleticism. He also, I think, is an underrated receiver. I think he's got some three-down ability uh, where I think certain teams are going to be able to use him, not as like a, a guy that's getting a ton of designed first-read looks, but certainly a safety valve receiver that can you know support his fantasy numbers and support his fantasy floor with some catches, but he's got explosiveness. This is the first Florida State running back to rush for 200 yards in a game since Dalvin Cook. There's a lot to like with Trey Benson athletically, draft capital-wise, and the price, Josh. He is running back 31. I'll ask you this because you've been doing underdog since the, since the beginning. You're an underdog expert here on the Dominator. This is the cheapest we've ever seen a rookie RB1 in the class since we've had underdog. So right now I'm getting Trey Benson mm -hmm. at running back 31. I think if he's Dallas Cowboys, he's running back 18 when we're drafting in August. Yeah, every single year we have rookie running backs finishing in the fantasy RB2 range. That's year after year. Literally every year you get that. This is maybe the worst class I can remember. We're still probably going to get that from one of these guys at least. Simply because rookies are fresh legs. And we have no idea what's going to happen with the depth chart, with the landing spot. How their college talent translates to the NFL. I am also taking a lot of Trey Benson. I'm also taking a lot. I know, uh, Theo, this is a, a crush of yours as well. Ricky Pearsall. His ADP is 160. Another guy that's pretty much free. Wide receiver 71. He's an elite separator. He's got great hands. He tested super, super well at the combine. He's probably getting drafted in the second round of the NFL draft. He's the type of player where I don't really care what team he goes to. He's someone that will get usage on day one. He's someone that can be utilized all over the field across the formation. And I, I don't see any way that his ADP doesn't rise after the NFL draft. He's basically being priced like he's taken, like he's getting taken in the third round and he's kind of okay at football and he's going round two and he's good at football folks. 
I, I think you nailed it. And and I've had a number of dynasty specific guests and guys who I consider to be real experts in terms of watching film and evaluating prospects. And when it comes to Cody Carpentier, Thor Nystrom, Brett Whitefield of Fantasy Points, I think all three of those guys are really sharp at this. And they disagree on a lot of players, but one guy they don't disagree on is Ricky Pearsall. He's been a guy that I think the the tape grinders have been into before the combine. And Josh, the guy, the combine he put on was insane. You did not see that coming. Had the highest vertical among all wide receivers. Very, very fast. Had probably the greatest catch you've ever seen in college football yes. history. If you like, just put in the UNC Charlotte catch for Pearsall. It's it's, it's absurd. Um, so I think I agree with you. He's being treated like a third rounder. I think he's almost a lock to be drafted inside of the second round. Goes to Pittsburgh Steel. Pittsburgh, he's their number two target. He goes to the Washington Commanders. He's their number two target. He goes to the Carolina Panthers. He's their number two target. There's many scenarios where he sees a big bump right after the NFL draft. Yeah, another guy that loves him that put me onto him about two months ago was Jordan Vanek. He is probably the best wide receiver evaluator that I'm really good friends with. And right from the get-go, he said, and this was kind of before other people started talking about him quite as much. He was, I didn't even know who this dude was. He was just like, he sent me the catch that you're talking about. And yeah. then he said, and then listen to this. And he told me about a few of his stats and how good he was, man coverage, zone coverage, everything. And then it was like, when I watch him on tape, I, I see a guy that NFL cornerbacks are not going to want to face. And he's probably going to get pretty soft coverage during his rookie year. I, I think he is a, a sneaky guy to suddenly you look up and you're like, wow, this was the the wide receiver five in points per game as a rookie. And he's going so, so, so late. Now let, let's, let's turn the tables a little bit. I want a rookie that you're probably fading in dynasty rookie drafts but you're willing to get exposure to him in best ball drafts. I talked about Jonathan Brooks earlier and why I'm a little concerned in dynasty, but I'm willing to take some stabs in best ball and redraft. Who is that player for you right now where you you might only have him on one dynasty team, but you're going to have him on a lot of underdog teams. So I'll, I'll say for dynasty, I'm talking to single QB uh, values right now um, and not super flex because super flex. I'm, I'm taking this guy at the one one in super flex drafts, but Single QB, I'm unwilling to take any quarterback sort of where I think he's going to end up. and But I want him on every single underdog roster that I can, and that's Caleb Williams. I think Caleb Williams, he's got it steamed up an underdog to a price point that it's maybe a little scary for some people. You were getting him at quarterback 16. Now he's settled in at quarterback 12. I think the clarity of the of the landing spot, the quality of the weapons in Chicago – and the fact that they have the ninth overall pick that they're most likely using on either a receiver, a tight end, or another offensive lineman have made like the underdog community say, okay, Caleb Williams a QB1. Um, but I think he could be a top five quarterback this year. Uh, he's got that underrated, uh, you know, opportunistic scrambling to his game that I think that the rushing ability is going to surprise some people. This is a big time athlete. Uh, that really hasn't really been earmarked as that. You know, everybody talks about the arm and his ability to pass on the move, but I think he'll have some rushing production uh, that's a little better than some people are expecting. And I'll throw it out there, either in year one or in year two, he is going to break the Chicago Bears record for most touchdown passes in a yes. season. It's a low bar. It's 29, which is not crazy, but I think that, you know, we're going to see a 35 touchdown season out of Caleb Williams at some point earlier in his career. And I'll say this, they draft Roma Dunze at nine. I don't love it for Roma Dunze, but I would absolutely love it uh, for Caleb Williams. I think he's an absolute stud and quarterback 12 is a discount. Yeah, I'd agree. And when you look at quarterbacks, they're going to get taken with the first overall pick. The destinations are generally pretty horrific. It is rare that you're airdropping a quarterback in with two very, very strong receivers with Keenan Allen, DJ Moore. Even Cole Komet's not half bad. DeAndre Swift's a good pass catching back. The offensive line's actually going to be at least average. There's so much to like with that situation this year. Something that there's uh, less to like is uh, some of these AFC West pass attacks. I'd say the Broncos and Chargers right now. I don't even know who the, the Broncos quarterback will end up being. Is it going to be Ryan Tannehill? 
I, I, I do not know. He, he is the wide receiver one by ADP for the Broncos. His ADP is 103. There is a team, though, the Chargers, much, much later. Josh Palmer, Quentin Johnston, their ADPs are 137 and 139, respectively. Do you have any interest in any of these uh, quote-unquote wide receiver ones where we're probably not going to love this passing offense, at least for volume's sake? No, not really. I, I've sort of been... The only, so I, I'll say for the AFC West, I, and I don't want to jump ahead because I had this guy as one of my 20th round targets. If you want me to want me to hold on to it, Josh, as a wide receiver. Hold him. Okay, so I'll hold on hold to it, one of them. But I'll, yeah, hold, but I hold, will say hold it just one, a little longer. Make yeah, the people I'll say, wait. I'll, <laughs> sort of like the only ugly AFC West uh, receiver that I've sort of had interest in is, is Josh Palmer, who I think like, I, 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 for what he is, I think he'll return value for his ADP. But I'm not excited to draft him. Yeah, he he would have been my pick too. Now, I'd say this is slightly more exciting. Let's talk about the Ravens. Drafters are pretty convinced at this point that Zay Flowers is going to outproduce Mark Andrews by a lot. Flowers ADP is 48. He plays receiver. Mark Andrews is at 54. He plays tight end. If Flowers is half around more expensive at a position with a higher bar for fantasy points, it, people think he's taking this big year two leap. Do you agree with the public? How are you handling these two? Since I'd say the Ravens pass attack in year two with Todd Monken is a very important one for us to get right in best ball. I don't want to have a cop out, but I could see building a stack with either. I, I'll say this wide receiver starts getting kind of sketchier and sketchier round by round. Whereas tight end, like I like Mark Andrews at ADP, um, but he's tight end four. When I look down like the list, like Evan Engram, you can select him 20 picks cheaper. Uh, Brock Bowers, he's he's sitting there at, at tight end nine. Uh, George Kittle in terms of spike weeks. So they're all cheaper than, than Mark Andrews. And it's not just that they're cheaper. It's that if I don't go wide receiver in that Mandrews range, then I... I don't necessarily love what's coming to me the next round as much. So I think Flowers and 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 Andrews, it's probably a similar bet in terms of who scores more points in, in half point PPR, but it's the positional scarcity where Zay Flowers, it's harder for me to make up passing on a wide receiver. I think that's sort of pushing people over. I'd say my exposure to those two guys is probably split down the middle. I just built a Lamar Jackson, Mark Andrews stack that I think is pretty good. Like you can do that. Uh, I think it's uh, what is it? The fourth and fifth round, or is it? It's the third and the third, uh, third and fourth round picks with a Lamar Jackson and Mark Andrews. You can build that stack sort of pretty easily. So I've done that a few times, but I do like some Zay Flowers. I think like if he simply would have gotten in the end zone in that playoff game, the narrative about him might have been a little bit different right now, and people might be even more excited about him because he certainly flashed at the biggest moments last year set a number of records for Ravens rookie uh, wide receiver records. They're not like any crazy bars to cross, but he did set them. Uh, and again, you brought up the fact that it's year two of the Todd Munkin offense. They could look to get Zay Flowers a lot more involved in year two with a little bit more confidence in the, in the now second year player. Yeah. Lamar Jackson ran a lot less last year. He only averaged 51 rushing yards per game. He was in the sixties. His, every year as a starter prior to that. So I think it's pretty clear that there was, there's becoming more and more shift on passing the football there. Now let's pivot to some running back talk. Give me an early round running back. You're not going to have much exposure to on underdog fantasy. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I looked at this question and I kind of, it's not necessarily a, a guy I, I don't like, but I don't like where I have to take him on underdog and that's Jonathan Taylor. Same. If I have to take Jonathan Taylor, Jonathan Taylor, I'm having to take him in the second round. I think that he should be more priced like a running back that we both are kind of in lockstep for uh, that I'm sure you're going to bring up shortly. But like I look at Jonathan Taylor and Josh Jacobs is available at 28 overall. Jonathan Taylor is available at 16 overall. Derek Henry's at 32 overall. Travis Etienne at 39 overall. I sort of think they're all a similar bet. Um, and with Anthony Richardson, you can make the argument that this is going to be like 2019 
Mark Ingram next to Lamar Jackson, and it's going to be this incredible, you know, season for for Taylor uh, next to a scrambling threat. But then there's another argument that Anthony Richardson leads all quarterbacks in rushing touchdowns this year, and he vultures plenty of them from Taylor. You also don't really picture Anthony Richardson being a guy who's going to dump off to the running back, um, you know, con- you know, and really pepper Taylor with targets, which has never been part of Taylor's game. So I think he's sort of a touchdown dependent, big play dependent uh, running back. And that scares me when I'm having to take him ahead of so many wide receivers in that range. Like the second round for me, it's Devon A-Chain or a wide receiver most of the time. Yeah, that's kind of how I view it as well. I think Taylor has forces working against him for pass catching and for goal line work. And those are the, the two ways that spike weeks often happen for these running backs. And I'll, I'll throw out this other name. So you talked about the Eagles earlier. I've stacked a lot of Eagles pass attack. Saquon Barkley also goes kind of early round two, like Taylor. And I just haven't taken a lot of him. I think there's the possible lack of pass catching when Jalen Hurts is at quarterback. He could get vultured by Jalen Hurts with touchdowns. He's 27 years old. He has a long injury history. I just don't think he has a top three finish in him in fantasy with this landing spot. So when he goes at RB6, there's other guys that go a touch later who I do see as having top three upside. And for that reason, I, I just don't have a lot of Saquon. So I don't have a lot of JT. I don't have a lot of Saquon. I, I think HN, if you want running back, that's the guy in that range where I also think he's got that truly massive like RB1 overall spike week potential week after week, just depending on what happens with Mostert and his health. So we podcast together often. Mm-hmm. So sometimes these these things sort of blur together. But we got into a sort of a Saquon Bar- Barkley argument uh, I believe this was first class fantasy where it was the two of us and Billy Muzio, where I think I took a more bullish approach to Saquon and you brought him up as a guy that could potentially uh, lose touchdown uh, equity this year and maybe play less snaps in a new offense. I'd say that when we look at it, he landed perfectly in terms of he's going to be on the field a ton. Kenneth Gainwell is not a threat to him. Uh, I mm-hmm. think that the, that the Jalen Hurts, the presence of Jalen Hurts, Last year, we saw DeAndre Swift only get 49 targets, which was a career low. So I will give you that Saquon Barkley is not going to be peppered with targets, which was sort of the dream for some, as he could land into a situation where he's almost Christian McCaffrey-like in terms of usage. But Josh, it's the best offense that Saquon Barkley's ever played in, the best offensive line he's ever played with, uh, the best skill position weapons around him. I think that there is a scenario where Saquon not drafting Saquon on underdog, even though I said I'm drafting wide receivers in round two, I don't want to be without Saquon Barkley like at all, because I think there's a scenario where he scores 15 touchdowns. He's had back-to-back years where he's had, you know, 10 plus rushing scores. This year could be just everything works well. Kellen Moore has the number one scoring offense in the league. Saquon's a huge beneficiary. So I don't know. I, I could go both ways on this one. I understand your argument, but I do think that there is a bull case with Saquon that's scary if we're avoiding him. I remember that that podcast episode. I, I will take the L there. Uh, Saquon was going late round two, and I said there were some landing spots that I was concerned about that would drop him. As we see now, he's going early round two. The ADP jumped. I did not think he was going to go to the Eagles. He did land with the Eagles. Uh, I, I think... If you were taking him late round two on the Eagles, I'd be pretty pumped. Early round two, I'm just a little bit concerned. Now, I think we're going to agree on both these guys. We each have an early round running back we're going to have a lot of exposure to. Who is your guy? It's Travis Etienne, hands down. All of my builds where I'm able to start with my, you know, I talked about the modified hero um, where I'm taking my first running back in like round four. I'm actually surprised that Travis Etienne is not a third round pick and like a, like a chalky third round pick the guy's 39. So again, he's close to the third round, but I would have guessed that his ADP would be, I I would have guessed that he would have been a little like slightly ahead of Josh Jacobs based on the newness of the situation in green Bay. Etienne last year gave us a top five year. It was his de facto year two in the league. 
and it was his second year with Doug Peterson. This year, Jacksonville loses Calvin Ridley, but the offense has a few things that are going to be quite similar to last year. Travis Etienne's role, Evan Ingram's role, and then Christian Kirk's role. I think this is going to be a very predictive weekly offense. Travis Etienne, if he was like... I'm a little surprised that he's not like running back seven in like the public consensus, but the fact that he's running back 11 and I'm able to start my build with him, it's like I'm drafting a guy that I think could be 15 points per game in PPR. I'm getting a 15 point per game scorer to start out my build. So he gives me the flexibility to go wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver, or mix in a Sam Laporta or a Josh Allen and avoid running back completely and get the same sort of bet that I might get on Jonathan Taylor in the second round. I think ETN is might be like the one you need in these early drafts. Yeah. I I truly don't know if Taylor or ETN has more fantasy points this next year, but I I do know that one guy uh, goes like a full two rounds earlier running back that I'm going to have a lot of exposure to. I talked about him on the dominator a few weeks ago where I, I gave the, the apparently scorching hot take that Josh Jacobs will outscore Saquon Barkley. I really like Josh Jacobs. His ADP is 29 running back nine. He's in a top 10 scoring offense environment in green Bay. It might even be a top five scoring offense. It is not a four year deal. When you look at the contract details, he didn't really sign a four year deal. He signed a one year deal. When you look at the guarantees, green Bay is going to run this guy into the ground. Jordan love last year gave Aaron Jones a 25% target share when you look at plays where Aaron Jones was on the field. Aaron Jones didn't play much last year. That's not the type of running back he is. His snap shares were often around 50%. Josh Jacobs is the type of running back that's on the field 65, 70, 80% of the time. He's going to get peppered with Jordan Love targets. He's going to get the goal line work because A.J. Dillon stinks. Josh Jacobs is a pretty good running back just in general, when it comes to running the ball, anytime he's healthy. We can't really count on health with any of these running backs, but when you take him in best ball, especially in a tournament, you're basically saying, cross your fingers, this year he stays healthy. I think if Josh Jacobs stays healthy this year, overall fantasy RB1 is in his range of outcomes. He's going to have an elite fantasy role for carries, for targets, for goal line work. I don't know what's not to like. Now, we'll switch the tables. Let's talk receivers quickly. Early round receiver, you just won't have much exposure to. It's not that we hate the player. We we simply just don't like the situation in the ADP. Yeah, so it's it's a tough one for me, um, but I think it's Devontae Adams. We've had three straight years where Devontae Adams has had 169 targets or more. We now see a quarterback change in Vegas where, you know, the 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 argument is, you know, Theo, Josh Jacobs is gone. You know, potentially a Gardner Minshew. Look what he did for Michael Pittman Jr. Uh, you know, Michael Pittman Jr. sees the most targets he's ever had attached to Minshew. Maybe it's going to be Minshew with Devontae Adams. I don't know. For me, it's just the second half of last season, We Devontae Adams, you know, ends up, you know, for the year finishing well when it comes down to, like, his overall finish uh, at the wide receiver spot. He was fine. But if you look at, like, the first half of the year versus the second half of the year, he had a number of weeks in a row where it just wasn't getting it done. Is that a sign of things to come for an older wide receiver? For me, it's just a, I don't feel dangerous in my builds when I'm drafting Devonte Adams at wide receiver 11. There's a couple of younger guys behind him that I think have more potential for spike weeks. Now, can Devonte Adams finishes a wide receiver one again? Sure, he's a great player, and I know he's going to get targets. But at the end of the day, is he going to stay in the 169-plus target range this year in a changing offense in Las Vegas? I'm not sure, and I feel like I'm drafting him at his ceiling. I feel like I'm drafting him at like where he's going to finish rather than a guy that I think could really beat his current ADP. And sort of the opportunity cost of taking him, he's going at 20th overall. Uh, It's just a tough bet for me to make right now. Yeah, I'm going to actually build off of that because the receiver that I'm concerned about, it's not necessarily that we we hate this receiver or we think he has bad talent. I think he's the best receiver in the NFL. I simply hate the situation. Justin Jefferson, his ADP is six overall. 
He has Sam Darnold or a rookie at quarterback. We don't like that. I I mentioned this on the Dominator a few weeks ago. I'm going to repeat it again because his ADP really hasn't moved much. And this is critical. Everyone is just passing around this quote-unquote stat that in four games without Kirk Cousins last year, Justin Jefferson averaged over 20 fantasy points per game, which is correct. But it is lacking so much context, so much nuance, that it is simply the worst way to interpret a small sample size that I've seen in quite some time. In those four games, three of those games were awesome. And those three awesome games were against Detroit twice and the Bengals once. Both were top three matchups for pass attacks last year. Of course he smashed. All three of those games, Nick Mullins reached 300 passing yards. The one game that he didn't face a cake secondary, the Packers, he did not play well. Five catches, 59 yards, no touchdown. That was on 10 targets. Brutal efficiency. That is not a usable score in best ball. That is under 10 points on underdog. I I just don't, I don't know what's going on here. I'm concerned with this Vikings offense looks like for Jefferson specifically. I talked before about why we want to bet against him and how I took the lower on his eight and a half receiving touchdowns on underdog fantasy a couple of weeks ago, simply because there's not going to be many touchdown passes to begin with there. The only fantasy wide receiver, la- wide receiver one last year on a bad pass attack was DJ Moore. 2021 and 2022, there were no stud fantasy receivers on bad offenses. Every few years it happens. We should not be expecting this elite fantasy finish from Justin Jefferson this year. There's the quarterback issues. He even has a lot of target competition with Jordan Addison and TJ Hawkinson. So we might not even get a full 30% target share. I, I don't know what's going on. Justin Jefferson looks like a late first round pick, early second round pick. He does not look like he should be going six overall. If you if you take Justin Jefferson ahead of Brees Hall in these underdog drafts right now, you deserve to finish outside the money. Wow, that's just that's just harsh way of putting it, Josh. Really harsh way of putting it on the uh, on the Justin Jefferson drafters. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough to say. I'll I'll say that the one I'll say the one scenario with these Minnesota pass catchers because I think Jordan Addison to a lesser degree has also gotten beat up in terms of what he can return this year because of the potential issues at quarterback for Minnesota. But the lack of TJ Hawkinson, could we have just a disgusting target share where Justin Jefferson sees like a career high target share gets peppered Mm -hmm. and maybe Jordan Addison sees such a benefit where those two guys are sort of like a Tyree kill Jalen Waddle situation. Plus I'm just trying to think of scenarios where, you know, you could get beat on this, but yeah, I mean, when it comes down to it, I agree with you. The fantasy ceiling of Brees Hall, essentially at the same ADP as Justin Jefferson, one player I think could finish number one at his position, and it's going to take a lot for Justin Jefferson to finish as the one wide receiver one this year, despite his immense talent. Mm-hmm. Give me a guy that you're more bullish on. We're in the early rounds of underdog, Theo. Who, who are you? Who are you pushing the draft button on quite often? I've been drafting a ton of Amon Ross St. Brown, who is not going much after uh, Jefferson. And I've loved to start out my draft with uh, Detroit Lions stacks. I've loved drafting Amon Ross St. Brown. I think that he's a little bit underrated in, in every single format right now, whether it's redraft, whether it's best ball, whether it's uh, dynasty for that matter. The guy last year showed us the touchdown ceiling that some people questioned. He had 10 touchdowns. He had 119 receptions. He had over 1,500 yards receiving. And the offense is going to be better this year. I think that building these Detroit stacks, Jared Goff is the value. Amon Ross St. Brown is the value. There's nothing not to like about the sun god. And I think that he's appropriately priced. Where I'm able to start my underdog draft with an elite wide receiver in this, the back half of the first round that I do think has wide receiver one overall in his range of outcomes. And I can draft him sometimes at like eight or nine overall. Does it concern you though, with Amon Ross St. Brown, that he has a low average depth of target. He's a low ceiling player. Wait a second, folks. Do you want to know who led the NFL in hundred yard receiving games last year? It was Amon Ross St. Brown. That is a real stat. Amon Ross St. Brown. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we don't want to. We don't. We don't want to dunk. We don't want to dunk on other analysts, and I'm not going to name them by name. But there's a 
former ESPN fantasy football analyst who does a good job. But in the preseason last year, like this is like the end of August, I see this guy comparing him to Julian Edelman. And I send a message to Billy Muzio and Matt Kelly. I'm like, this one's going to bite this guy. And lo and behold, not very Julian Edelman-like in his performance in 2023. Yeah, I don't think Julian Edelman ever led the league in 100-yard receiving games. Now, I know that you don't like this player very much. I'm going to I'm gonna provide the bull case. You already took a subtle dig at Chris Olave earlier in the show. I, I've taken a lot of Chris Olave. Maybe I'm a fish. So he, he's played two years. He had over 1,000 yards both years. So we at least know the floor is pretty good. He's going to be 24. He's in his prime. There's no target competition in New Orleans right now. They play in a dome. It's his second year playing with Derek Carr. Derek Carr had injuries last year. And when he was finally healthy, that's when they really started to cook together. I mentioned Amon Ross St. Brown led the NFL in 100-yard games. CeeDee Lamb, Tyreek Hill, A.J. Brown, Brandon Ayuk, Puka Nakua. Those are the only players with Amon Ra who had more 100-yard games last year than Chris Olave. I think that'll surprise people that he had the seventh most. The Saints' defense is aging. They might be flat-out bad in 2024. You could be getting shootout game environments in a dome where he has more quarterback chemistry with Derek Carr. I, I'm, I'm taking a lot of Chris Olave. I, I think the, the floor is pretty good, and I think the ceiling is actually still there for, for touchdowns. Yeah, it's. I, I'll, say, I'll say this. It's a little bit of a. You don't like, have to like him, Theo. If you no, I, I'll make. Yourself- I'll, I'll say this. I'll say it's the dynasty. <laughs> you know. You know. I'm. I'm doing. You know. A lot of my content's dynasty related, and it's sort of like a Chris Olave is always this guy that's being valued higher than his actual production. Uh he's he's wide receiver ten on keep trade cut, meaning the dynasty marketplace is treating him as the tenth most valuable receiver in dynasty. That I think is a mistake, but. I'll give you this, Josh. The one thing about Olave, he's wide receiver 17 on underdog. So I do think the price is appropriate for, for taking shots on him. Um, last year, you were having to take him closer to the wide receiver one line on underdog. So draft away, Josh. He's not going to burn you. I, I think I took him this morning on underdog. I just I never feel dangerous. I feel like it's one of these things where he's going to remain a high-end, you know, high to mid-level wide receiver two that every year we just want to take that next step. I don't trust Derek Carr either. I just, I, I don't, I don't, I've kind of soured on Carr and I was way more bullish on Olave last off season when he was more expensive on underdog. So I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm call me a neutral to not quite fading because mm-hmm. I draft him a little bit, but I'm sort of neutral at seeing the bull case for how much value he's going to return at wide receiver 17. This is his 2023 DJ Moore season book it. Where okay. year after year, like, oh, DJ Moore, he doesn't quite live up to it. The peripherals are awesome, but the fantasy points aren't there. The, this is the year Chris Olave gets in the fantasy points department. Now, we, we've talked about the, these early round picks. Give me uh, give me a, two, three guys that you're taking in the 19th, 20th round right now on Underdog. You're closing out your team, and you think these guys are going to give you some spike weeks. So I'll give you a couple. Greg Dortch was sort of the automatic one, but now you're starting to see him go in like the 18th round. Um, he's still wide receiver 90 on underdog. So he's he's some going somewhere in those last few rounds. He's drafted every draft though. Um, I don't really need to explain Greg Dortch. Kyler Murray likes him and he's going to be on the field a lot next year in Arizona. Uh, ben Sanat is sort of my go-to tight end for three tight end builds if I want to wait on tight end three. I think he's got big fantasy potential. I think there's a chance he's a second round pick. Uh, Two weeks from today, I think Ben Sinat might be drafted. He had the highest vertical among all tight ends at the Combine, ran a faster 40 than Jatavian Sanders. He was a very high A dot guy at Kansas State, led Kansas State in receiving yardage, led Kansas State in receiving touchdowns last year. So he projects as a guy that I think could contribute in fantasy uh, immediately as a rookie. And then Josh Reynolds. Josh Reynolds has been one that I've been drafting a good amount of in the 20th round now. I think he's going to be a pain for Marvin Mims managers. They gave him a two-year deal. He had he had weeks that helped us in best ball last year if you drafted him in deep best ball leagues in Detroit. Why won't he do that with less target competition in Denver as a 20th round pick? Those are sort of my, my three. 
I like all those folks. That's Theo Greminger at the OG fantasy on Twitter. He is the director of content at player profiler. He will be covering the NFL draft in two weeks live from Detroit. I like the Benson hot one. I I'll be honest. I have not done my tight end research yet. That is the one position I haven't covered yet. So I was just a, a sponge with that, with that analysis. I loved that. Speaking of the NFL draft, we're going to get the folks out of here. This is the dominator. And the NFL draft is in two weeks. Player team fit that you're most excited to have happen in a couple oh, of weeks I mean, where, where he, he gets drafted there and you you stand up, the hands go up, you're being obnoxious, you're excited. What, what is that player team fit? I, I hate to go so so high profile, but Marvin Harrison Jr. goes number five overall to the Los Angeles Chargers. He is going to compete for wide receiver one overall in fantasy scoring. I think he could go absolutely nuclear with that landing spot. That's the one I'm looking for. Hey, I want to thank you for being part of this broadcast. If you have any thoughts on it, leave a comment. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a like. And if you want to see more shows on the Player Profiler channel, subscribe to it. That's how we know you want more.